Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the place to be, the BMHC, the Bronx Music Heritage Center. My name is Bobby Sanabria. I am the co-artistic director with the great Elena Martinez here. And welcome to our evening of Voices of Justice tonight. It's going to prove to be exciting as the truth will be revealed through our fine, fantastic guests. Let me tell you a little bit about what's happening with the BMHC uh, coming in March of 2022. Well, uh, some good things because we'll be moving to the Bronx Music Hall, a beautiful 250-seat uh, theater auditorium, multi-use theater auditorium that has an outdoor amphitheater in the back, an outdoor amphitheater in the front. So that's exciting. So look for more announcements about that. You can even go to our BMHC, Bronx Music Heritage Center, Facebook page and see our, some of our BMH blasts. Uh, that go through the construction process uh, with different artists performing in front of the forthcoming BMH Bronx Music House, Heritage Center Bronx Music Hall. So that's very, very exciting. We're very happy about that. It's been a 10 year process. It's finally coming to an end. We hope everybody's doing well. We know that everybody's dealing with the pandemic and now we got some variations on it <laughs> happening now. But as always, our people always meet everything with our chair positive energy and one of the people that always has positive energy is the lady right next to me the co-artistic director of the bronx music heritage center how about it for the one and only elena martinez hi everyone yeah. welcome. <laughs> welcome to um voice of justice as bobby said and before we start i want to give a shout out to our funders the bronx music heritage center programming is supported in part by the national government of the arts New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the New York State Legislature, public fund from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, and the Lily M. Tisch Illumination Fund. And tonight for um, uh, our Voice of Justice program, um, you know, we started this program, I think last year, you know, about a year and a half ago, we started this program to sort of address issues that um, relevant issues that um, that are that are, are part of of um, the world we live in today and our society today. But we wanted to do it with them um, bringing um, activists in to talk about some of these issues, but also with artists. Where the BMHC, the Bronx Music Heritage Center, is a performing arts center, it's a cultural center. You know, the work we do is grounded in in, in artists, um, music artists, visual artists, all you know of all of all different all different genres. And um, so we wanted to bring. Um, artists and activists together to talk about some of these issues and then how maybe um, artists, you know, how are artists dealing with some of these issues and how is that, how are they expressing um, what's going on in their work? So um, we've come, we've been able to deal with um, a lot of great programming and the programming we have tonight is a, it's a very serious one, it's a very um, relevant topic and, it, you know, this summer, and what makes it, I think, even important that we get a chance to talk with these great women um, activists and artists today um, is that there's, um, this summer, you know, there many people probably saw on all the mainstream, you know, channels and news, all sorts of really horrendous, horrific imagery of um, what was going down, what was happening at the border with the Haitian um, um, refugees that were there at the border of, of Texas. And also, of course, later on in September with um, the, the pullout of the United States from Afghanistan. And what these two issues were everywhere. And we saw the, you know, uh, you know, uh, all these, um, really tragic images for a while but then of course everything dropped off the news just dropped off we live in a world with a 24-hour news cycle and then these issues are still happening and 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 people are still dealing with all these issues in many different ways and but we don't hear about it so um and, and these issues are still very relevant and very important and they have a long history and they're also still going on so we want to kind of talk about all, bring about all these um talk about all these issues today um that are that are that the Haitian community and the Afghan community are dealing with right now. And um, just want to um, first give a shout out to the, um, the, the our panelists, our panelists, our participants in, in today's program. First, we have with us um, Kirby Joseph, who is um, from Brooklyn. Um, she's, yeah. a <laughs> she's a community organizer who's worked with many different groups. She works with The Answer, Act Now to Stop War and, and Racism Coalition, and she's organized um, Mark, the, the Stop the Cops March, Unity March from Bronx to Harlem, as well as worked on a lot of other issues, um, social justice issues. There's also Euphony, who is a performance and visual artist based in New Jersey. Um, she's a visual artist. She's also um, an MC, and she um, has performed at places like NJPAC and Lincoln Park Music Festival. Um, we have also with us um, 
I, I think from Brooklyn as well, another um, Brooklyn per, um, participant, um, Jaira Placid, who is a PhD student at the English department in, in CUNY and a graduate student fellow for special projects at the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute. She's also um, been a volunteer at the New Sanctuary Coalition in New York as a Haitian Creole translator. And she's a, an author of a young adult novel, Fresh Girl, as well as two poetry chapbooks. And also with us today, all the way from California, we're so excited to have with us Gazelle Samize, who is a video artist based in California, who works with the Afghan American Artists and Writers Association. And she's been working on an art project installation documenting um, the process of what's been going on, um, the current situation in Afghanistan. And to lead us in today's, oh, before we get on to um, introduce our um, curator and moderators, Anyone watching on Facebook right now, um, as we go to the program, um, if you have any questions for any of these participants, put them in the Facebook chat and we'll relay them to the participants. So um, you're, you're welcome to, if you're watching on Facebook, just put them in the, in the Facebook comments section and we'll try to get those questions to the participants. But to lead our conversation today uh, as moderator, um, we have with us two members of Rebel Diaz, G1 and Rod Stars, and they also have a special connection to this history as they come from Chile and they will talk about the sort of like Chile Haitian connection to um, a lot of the current events that are going on now. So I um, want to welcome Rod Stars to start us off. Oh, peace, peace, peace out. Appreciate everybody for being here with us. You there, G? What's up, G? What's going on? Peace, peace, everybody. Peace, Rod. Peace, Elena, yeah, for, Bobby. You know, it's, I, I want to definitely shout out Elena. You know, we, we, we brainstorming what kind of, uh, you know, themes we're going to come up with. And we had connected, like, let's try to do one before the year ends. You know what I'm saying? Um, and 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 this is right around the time when there was, you know, things were, were, were popping off with the Haitian community, with the Afghan community. And we were like, yo, this is very important. I felt a personal connection because me and my brother, we we refugees ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We exiled from a dictatorship in Chile. And so we've always... Uh, felt like an international connection when it comes to communities that that are uh you know in survival and also in resistance but that are living you know processes of, of u.s imperialism and so today you know this is uh bronx music so we're definitely going to talk about culture i want this to be more of a, of a vibe that we share not really like you know saying two panels so please feel free to have conversation um but you know for us it's important uh, you know, to, to, to bring these uh, issues to the forefront, whether it's through hip hop culture, through our music, through our lyrics. Uh, you know, I, it's amazing to hear, you know, folks like, uh, and meet folks like Jaira who have, you know, who are authors of young adult, you know, books, or, which, are, which is such an important age group, you know what I mean? Um, or artists like Euphony, activists like Kirby, who we've been on the front line with, and also, you know, great to meet Gazelle. So it's, it's, it's gonna, I look forward to the conversation. Um, so to jump straight into it, you know, let, let's give a quick breakdown. You know, we're dealing uh, with what some may feel is a larger, you know, like such an issue. Like we could do a whole panel just on Haiti or a whole panel just on what's going on. But the reason we're doing them together is that we feel that the culprits of these situations are very much the same. And so we want to put this conversation uh, from a lens uh, of understanding that these are are things that are happening not uh, for no reason, but because there is U.S. foreign policy and U.S. imperialism that has historically had its history intertwined uh, with, with countries like Haiti, in which they were the first, you know, free independent countries, you could say, in the Western Hemisphere, and how the U.S. as a, as a country whose economy was based on slavery always viewed Haiti, you know, through the lens of white supremacy and anti-blackness and feared that the rebellious nature of, the, of, 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 of Haiti and its history of rebellion was going to inspire slave rebellions in its very own lands uh, of the United States. And so we're clear um, that the US uh, and Haiti's history has constantly been you know, intertwined through this uh, you know, white supremacy that exists very much as a foundation of the United States as a country. Um, when we look at the Afghan situation, you know, one of the largest groups of uh, refugees in the world, 6 million people displaced, 40 years, you know what I'm saying, of this displacement going on, uh, wars that uh, a lifetime for some of us who are on this panel, uh, you know, and, and, and once again, the hands 
of US imperialism, whether it was them pushing buttons for you know wars against the USSR and the Taliban and, and the, the ideas of anti-communism, right? We also see the parallels of the anti-communism in which are uh, under, uh, and I'm gonna try to say this as nice as uh, Jair does, under Duvalier, right? How he was also an anti-communist, yet he you know, murdered thousands of people and was a human rights violator. Um, we see these parallels in how U.S. foreign policy uh, puts their hands in, you know, internal situations to push realistically, uh, you know, uh, use them as almost like pawns, whether it was for a Cold War against the USSR or whether it's today a power struggle against China. And so, um, you know, a little bit of a historical context, there's obviously much more history, um, but that's why we have our panelists who will give us more information on that. But I definitely wanted to just throw that out there, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and which is the reason we chose to do this together. Um, it's also interesting, we come from Chile, you know, me and my brother, and I think that there's a very interesting connection in some of, uh, you know, that, that, you know, what's going on with the Haitians on the border and how that connects to Chile. You know specifically, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about it, about that as well. But I want to get, you know, I want to I want to um I want to start off how we start things off uh, with voices of justice because this is about culture and this you right now tuned in to Facebook.com backslash BX Music. You know what I'm saying? So you know we're gonna start off with some with some energy, uh, and we're gonna go to Jersey and we're gonna have Comrade Euphony bless our ears and our spirits with a little music to start. Uh, the energy off right. So uh, I present to you, Euphony. When I met her, I was taken away by the talent um, and, and she's a special talent. And I, I always want to, you know, try to see how we can involve this amazing talent in whatever we do. So she's here. It's an honor for us uh, for you to be here today, Euphony. And we look forward to you performing. So take it away. You're muted, you're muted. Wow, wow, wow. This whole time I thought I was speaking to you guys. So good. I was like, wait, 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 I thought it was my phone. I thought it was my phone. It's Sorry. all good. Thank you. You. We gonna hit you with the funk mess flex. Bringing it back, euphony. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Bring it back. So hello, once again. Um, I'm Euphony. I'm a 22-year-old performance and visual artist. I sing, I rap, I do poetry. Um, I instruct paint and sip classes sometimes. Uh, I usually do music that is geared towards um, just the state of society. I won't necessarily say social injustice, but it does focus on that a lot as well. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. So this first song is called Power. It's on all streaming platforms. My Instagram is Euphony. I am hopefully at some point, I'll be able to put it in the chat. Um, and yeah, let's get started. I'm searching for a sign in the sky, searching for some answers. Running so life don't pass us by, right into the dark. I'm praying for the knowledge to figure out in time. I'm praying for the wisdom, the wisdom to survive. When you look up, can't you see the skies aren't blue? When you look up, can't you see the skies are blue? Yes, you are. You are, yes, you are. Oh, well, we just you have the power. The power is for you. Yes, you have. Do, 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 do. Yes, you are. Ooh. Said, we breathing the pollution in the air. My people dying, they denying that it's there. Sooner or later, you got to slow up the pace. I look around and I'm living a rat race. Mr. Not my president, still sitting in the chair. But equality and freedom aren't too far from here. No more living in fear. No more sit back and watch. The time is now. I made a vow. I got to give it my all. Said, when you look up, can't you see the skies are blue? When you 
look up, can't you see the sky? Do 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 yes, you have the power. Yes, you have the power. You had, you had, yes, you had the power. The power is for you. Yes, you have the power. We breathe in the pollution in the air. Uh, my people dying, they denying that it's their woe. Sooner or later, we gotta slow up the pace, 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 pace. Huh. We breathe in the pollution in the air. My people dying, they denying that it's their. Sooner or later, we gotta slow up the pace, 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 pace. So yes, you have the power. Okay, so thank you all for listening. That was song number one. Once again, I'm reaching out uh, on Instagram. Um, I'm going to do another song later. I'll be with you guys. Um, thank you so much for showing up. And yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah. That's what's, That's what's up. I love it. I love it. That's dope. Was I right, y'all? Was I right? Because the rest of the chat, you know what I mean? I never lied to y'all. I never lied. That's what's up. Um, and so Euphony is also representing Haiti, you know what I'm saying? Um, which, which I thought it was a perfect connection to bring into, into this conversation. Um, yes, yeah. But I wanted to start, I'm going I'm to throw, throw the Ali Youth right now, to Comrade Kirby, you know what I'm saying? Um, and Kirby, you know. I had a feeling you were coming to me first, too. Come on, Kirby, you know how we do. I avoid it. We get straight to the you know, straight to the work. So you know, through the work that you've done with Answer Coalition, you know, it's, it's, it's so crazy because I have such memories of you being so much on the front line for a Kai Gurley, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, like, yo, like that was like, that's where you was at, hard body. And so I got to honor you for real, just for that, that, that activism that's been really a lifetime at this point, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and the work that you've done. And so, you know, I got to come, and be like, I gotta see how Kirby thinks about the situation. Tell me a bit about how you view the influence of US imperialism in, in, in what's going on in Haiti now and historically uh, has, has, has happened with US imperialism and US foreign policy when it comes to Haiti. Okay. I just wanna uplift that we actually got a street named after Akai this year in the same Let's year go. he was killed. Absolutely, I, I, I write Akai Gurley for sure. Um, so, Haiti was the vanguard, right? Like when you think of like the first in the Western hemisphere being the first black nation to gain its independence, to rid itself of French occupation in a way, it's something that no other country can say that they did. But Haiti since 1804 have been paying for their liberation, right? Um, and it's something that we see just like in the United States, ultimate, ultimate uh, imperialist government. You so know? hold on, I, I don't mean to, to interrupt, but I also, I like, you know, I want people to really grasp what you're saying. So you're saying that since 1804, yeah. Haiti has been financially for their liberation? Well, financially, yes, um, because France claimed right. that Haiti owed it, it money for fighting for its independence, but also paying in the sense of like, being put in a chokehold. A lot of people don't know that Frederick Douglass was actually Haiti, um, America's ambassador to ambassador. Haiti. Right. Um, and he, after the, the revolution happened, he went to visit Haiti. And he went back to Thomas Jefferson, who we know is the ultimate, ultimate hypocrite, ultimate white supremacist representative, ultimate slave owner. But when he reported back to Thomas Jefferson and he said, listen, you know, Haiti needs time to grow, right? It just got its liberation. We need to leave it alone. And Thomas Jefferson was like, no, and immediately made sure that there was ships in Haiti um, to start the process of like further occupying it and sucking it dry of its resources. People have to understand that Haiti was looked at as a jewel, the jewel of the Caribbean because of its production of sugar, um, because of um, the labor that slaves put into the island every day, right? And so since then, Haiti has been paying for its liberation. And something that you said is true um, because the Fugitive Slave Act is the direct response to Haiti's liberation, 
because slaves were getting information. They always get information. And when Haiti got its revolution, it set off the channels for slaves of people in the United States, all over the world. And to make sure that slaves did not revolt in the way that Haiti did, they created the Fugitive Slave Act to make sure that they put harsher punishments on slaves in America. So its liberation was not only a battle cry, but also one of the first phases of racist policies being put forth in America. And it's just so, so deep because it's not about a Democrat or a Republican, it's about capitalism, right? Because if you take it a step further, we had a massive earthquake. You had people donate all over the world billions of dollars that Haitians never touched, right? Where it made room for politicians like Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton to come in and claim that they were helping, but actually started further stealing resources from Haitians, denying financial upliftment of Haitians. They didn't even want Haitians to make a dollar a day, a US dollar a day. Okay, from 50 cents a day to a dollar a day was right. impossible. We could not do that, right? And because of that, Haitians have some of the largest populations of people leaving, right? And going to the countries where their occupiers are. There's Haitians in France. There's 800,000 Haitians in New York City, right? Um, there's Haitians in Cuba because Cuba opened up its doors to allow Haitians to learn through education. My cousin was actually part of the doctorate program in Cuba because wow. Haiti okay. has an 80% unemployment rate, 80% zero. So that means that because they don't have their resources, they don't own them, right? That the U.S. are dumping their products, their imported food into the country, overcharging Haitians to buy those products and they don't reap any of the rewards that they make from their labor, people leave, right? right on. And the, the thing that's really, really deep about it is that people will say that, well, why can't they organize and why can't they get it together? But actually it's not about Haitians getting it together and organizing. Haitians are on the ground every day organizing. Haitians have created informal e economies for themselves because obviously there's not a government that cares about their economy and they maintain their communities by themselves, literally creating informal right. jobs, um, creating informal families, feeding each other so people don't starve on the street, all because they've been sucked dry of their resources because right. of US and international imperialism. Thank you, Kirby. I appreciate that, that, that breakdown. You know, I feel like we needed to start off with that breakdown off top. Um, I want to share a quote. We're going to play a little game. We're going to guess. Guess who said this? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we're going to do it. Come get your mans in them. That's what we're going to call it. So look, this quote says, if Haiti just quietly sunk into the Caribbean, it wouldn't matter a whole lot in terms of our interest. Any wild guess on who said this? Again, if Haiti just quietly sunk into the Caribbean, it wouldn't matter a whole lot in terms of our interest. Does it start with a B? Uh, his, his, uh, his last name or his first name? Uh, I don't know. We can say the last name. It's not a last name. No, you got to be specific. Hey, you, you, we guess it here. This is like a game. It start with Ooh. a I and, and with a then. <laughs> so you want to take, a, you wanna take, a, you wanna take a, a stab at it? What is it? I'm gonna guess that it's Biden. Correct, you are 100% yeah. correct. All right. You know, 1994, President Biden, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so just to put things in context, is the current president of the United States today, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, less than 30 years ago, you know what I'm saying, was, was saying this. Um, so. Kirby, you said a little something that I feel like is a perfect segue uh, to pass the basketball. We, we throw all the oops over here with the conversation. Uh, in, the, in the direction of Jaira, you know, uh, one of the things that, that struck me about Kirby, she talked about the immigrant hustle. 
the immigrant experience, uh, the, the survival of the immigrant uh, communities coming from Haiti. Jaira has a book uh, for young adults called Fresh Girl. Um, and it's about an immigrant family. Tell us a bit about uh, the inspiration, because we know we talk about arts and culture here, right? Obviously with our connection to these global important uh, po political issues, but tell us a bit about uh, experience doing art, you know, a book for young adults, Fresh Girl, and about uh, an immigrant Haitian family. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want, can you hear me? Okay, great. First of all, thank you to um, the center, to Elena Kirby and Jorge, who's behind the scenes working, working what he, what he does. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, thank you for the question. It's actually um, the inspiration for Fresh Girl came from, a, the idea came from like the 1991 coup that happened in Haiti um, when Aristide was overthrown the first time. And I remember just hearing all, all of these very, very chilling, um, horrendous stories coming out of Haiti, um, especially about what, what was happening um, with, with women and sexual abuse and how during warfare women and children are the first on the battle lines, you know, to, you know, to get killed or, you know, assaulted. So it affected me in a way that I, it, it planted a seed in my head to, to ask the question, what would it look like for someone to, to leave a place like that and then try and resettle in, in the metropole in, in, in America. So um, that was the main inspiration for the book, the 1991 coup d'etat. Uh, one of the main characters was affected by it and came here and, and she is trying to live her everyday life while st struggling with this trauma that she really did not leave behind. And a lot of people think that you come to America, you forget everything that was before you because this place is shiny, this place is bright, this place is full of promise. You can rebuild yourself and you could um, rename yourself, make a new name for you and what have you, but there's still a lot of your, the, the suitcase that you, bring, that you bring with you. You know, sometimes it's very heavy, sometimes it has some good stuff in it. And, and, and a lot of times, especially if it's you're talking about um, a, a forced migration, for whatever, you know, for some of the imperialistic reasons that um, Kirby had mentioned, you know, the suitcase is packed with stuff, you know? So it's not just about, um, you know, you look at a country and you think, you know, why can't that country pour this, pour that? And, and also, if, if you notice, the narrative is going from Haiti from being the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, which is still there, but now to like the failed state. That's the new lingo. That's the new thing that they're saying. The failed state, the failed state. So that's gonna be the, the moniker now. That's gonna go right next to, that's gonna go right next to Haiti. So um, in thinking about being in the arts and um, being a writer, I'm always thinking about um, the visual narratives and what people think about and what they see when they hear a um, about a country that is out of context and out of context in a way that never looks points the, the points the, the finger back at them like a U.S. involvement participation or, or different kinds of different countries participations in the country that create the conditions that that you know, that make people want to leave, that overthrow governments, that create a great deal of instability. You know, nobody wants to talk about that. It's always at that, that moment. Imagine you at your lowest moment and somebody comes and says, oh, why are you like that? But doesn't ask you the questions. It doesn't look at your neighbors, doesn't look at the entire um, person, the entire situation. So, um, yeah, so that was my, the inspiration for that novel came directly from this, you know, the overthrow of a, of a, of a government. And 1991, the first elected, freely elected gov um, president, you know, he wasn't killed. Like Jovenel Moise was, was, was assassinated, but he was overthrown. And you know that the U.S. has a history, you know, of, of their hands in certain kind of, 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 those kinds of endeavors and destabilizing countries. So 
Yeah, yes. so that, that was a direct. I, I appreciate that that connection, uh, Jaira, that, that you're making uh, between your art. Um, it, it's so intense to hear how the 1991 coup was a direct inspiration for that. So, you know, I definitely want to be able to check it out from that lens uh, when, I, when I have time. So I appreciate you making that connection. Um, I also appreciate you bringing up the reality, you know, of, um, and I'm not going to pronounce it, but it's uh, Jovenel Moise. Is that what you said, correct? Yes. And so of how, you know, that there was a brazen assassination that happened July of this of this year, 2021, you know? Um, and I want people to think about it. Like, imagine the chaos if Biden was assassinated. Like, you have a nation's leader assassinated, and clearly there's some type of U.S. connection, and you have to call it for what it is, you know, call it spade a spade. When you have two U.S. citizens who are, you know, Haitians that are citizens of the U.S. directly involved, and then 17 Colombian mercenaries. Like, who's the number one ally of, you know, uh, of the U.S. in Latin America? Who has the most military bases in, in the Western Hemisphere? It's Colombia. And so you have to see it for what it is. Um, and we're clear that it's not by chance uh, that Haiti is one of the poorest countries. Um, and, and, and so we're, we, we see this. And so it's important to put it in context. I wanted to throw, uh, you know, the conversation... Uh, a bit across, let's go, let's go across the ocean. You know what I'm saying? Um, and we're going to definitely touch back on Haiti. But I want to talk about a situation which you have nearly 6 million Afghans who have been displaced, uh, whether it's through conflict, violence, poverty, issues, but we're clear, uh, issues of imperialism that for 40 years, uh, people have been being displaced. You look at 20 years ago, which was the last mass displacement that happened after the U.S. invasion, which is post 9-11, um, and then you have the recent, um, you know, refugee influx into different parts, right, of, of, of Europe and here in the United States, as the United States uh, withdraws their troops, and 20 years later, the same chaos is still present as the Taliban take over. Um, and so, once again, we have the common denominator of U.S. imperialism, right? And so, Gazelle, tell us a bit about you know, about some of his history uh, th th that I'm sharing and, and how these are also connections that we can make to the overall conversation. Yeah. Now, obviously, tell us about your work. I don't want to bombard <laughs> you with questions right away, but you know, feel free to obviously vibe with us and share, us, share what you do. But in the context of that, give us a little bit of that, that strength. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me. And I definitely related to things that both Kirby and Jaira said. Um, about one sort of that conflict of living in the country of the colonizer of, of your home country and to um, sort of those false promises of, of the shiny American experience, which um, in my recent efforts of trying to help evacuate Afghan artists, they've had you know, such high hopes to come here and um, we're doing what we can, but then at the same time, there's also a reality check of, you know, hopefully if you can make it out and you do get here, it's not gonna be all roses either. And it's also gonna be a difficult life. And I think it's just, it's heartbreaking that anyone has to leave their country. I think Rodrigo, you might have mentioned this in the intro or maybe in the email exchanges that, um, you know, I think if given the choice, these people would stay in their countries. And I, and I, I think that they deserve to live peacefully there. But um, as so many people have touched on, like the US interference in the country has made it such that they can't live there safely. Um, my personal work as an artist, I work in multimedia. Um, I was born in Afghanistan, but we left during the Soviet invasion uh, when I was a baby. And I think being disconnected, but also, you know, having the influence of Afghan culture, like inspired me to kind of research more about Afghan culture and my family's history. So I often, my artwork often tells kind of personal stories um, with the backdrop of more like social or political issues. 
So as you mentioned, it's kind of crazy to think about, um, you know, being a witness to like a lifetime of conflicts. And, um, you know, I'm not so old, I'm 40, but at the same time, you know, there's- Yeah, you're young. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's Afghans who like, they grew up in war. Like they were born in war and they grew up with it and they're still dealing with it as, um, you know, 20 year olds or, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. And um, I know you asked like, you asked some kind of big questions. Could you bring me back to, to what no, you- No, I, I just wanted you to basically just tell us a bit um, about, you know, what you had made, your, your connections with the, these 40 years of displacement, um, which you brought us up, you know how, you know, it, it, it's real. Like I talked about, 20 years ago, but you're taking it back to the eighties. You guys yeah. have been displaced, you know, right. for 40 years. Um, and so I was just saying like, you know, to, that the question was maybe more to share, like, why is this happening? Why has this been happening yeah. in the region um, and what's being done to help, you know, yeah. maybe elaborate a little bit on, on, on some of the stuff that, you know, that you're doing to help. Yeah. I think that um, it is important to understand the history of what's going on, because as you mentioned, the U S is, um, anti-communist um, agenda definitely influenced the country because they were funding the Mujahideen at that time. Um, and then eventually after the Soviet Union withdrew, the Mujahideen was in power, but they were also um, pretty brutal in terms of human rights violations. Um, we hear a lot about the Taliban and I think we we heard about them because of 9-11. Um, but, but prior to that, the Mujahideen was also doing really terrible things. And those weapons that they have came from the US. Um, and there's just a long history of kind of funding groups or warlo warlords um, that happen to be convenient for the US's agenda in the moment without a lot of like long-term thought about the effects of that. Um, so it's really been a destabilizing force in the country. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's a, that's a key, uh, you know, word is the destabilization, you know, that, that, that that's created. Um, countries, you know, like, like I, I think what I was sharing in the email convo was, you know, country, the same way people don't choose to leave everything they know and everything they love for no reason. Yes. Countries ain't going just for no reason not use their own resources and have political chaos going on internally. There's outside forces, you know what I mean, with interest. Like we have to be clear, like when we talk about Afghanistan too, is like, you know, how much of mass incarceration has been about this war on drugs and what are the connections to opiates, you know what I'm saying, that, that are being, you know, like look at the rise I don't think it's. I don't think it's. It's. It's a complete disconnect. When you look at the rise of prescription pills, you know what I'm saying, and and how that's become a problem in this country, and you know, forty years of of, of taking opiates, you know what I mean, resources that that you know, and then misusing them. So I think there's a lot of connections, and so I appreciate that. I wanted to swing it over to Euphony, who blessed us with her beautiful, you know, music. Um, how, so your song, you know, was you know we heard. Like the, the, the theme was like about power. How do you draw power as a Haitian artist? How do you draw power from, you know, knowing the, the rebellious spirit of, of, of your homeland? Um, that's kind of like the, my, my beginning question is how do you, how do you draw power from, from that? And then how do you, as, a, as an artist, you know what I'm saying? Cause you know, I feel like when you're an immigrant, there's also a lot, like I always say, I represent Chile, but I'll be in the Bronx and I know you represent Jersey. You know, as an artist, Haitian artist living in Jersey, how does like your people on the border, you know what I'm saying? Like those images that are very strong, how does that affect your art? And so this is kind of a two part question, you know what I'm saying? How do you draw power from your, from your roots? And then how do you, you know, feel when you see what's going on with your community? Um, for the first half of your question, I guess ultimately the song overall is about 
how the individual can always take power back or have power in a circumstance, even when externally it doesn't seem like it'll get any better. Um, I feel like my people have always been about the power of the individual and the power of our roots and our ancestry. And um, I think that naturally me just kind of having that in my blood influenced me to be the person that I am who wants to have autonomy over you know, myself, my resources, my ability to just be, to be free. <laughs> um, it rhymes, but I wasn't trying to be corny. I was being very literal. Um, I feel like I am affected in many different ways for the second half of your question. Um, it makes me want to try my best to not release anything that isn't just frivolous like I want to make sure when I make music and when I perform music people can understand that I'm speaking from not just my own perspective and not just for my own perspective or for my own well-being um there's a lot going on in the world not even just my people there's a lot going on everywhere um that is similar to what is happening with my people so it's like I like to put that kind of pain that I see when I see those images and when I see my people being, um, when, when everyone is misled about what's going on, um, it's kind of hard to just sit by and not do anything. And the only thing that I have is my ability to express. So it makes me put more into my music, you know what I'm saying? Like, I guess more substance, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, would you like me to continue? Would you like me to go deeper or is there <laughs> No, no, we, we, we all tuned in. I'm, I'm open on your answer. Yeah, yeah, feel free if you have more to share, please share. Um, And if not, it's cool, whatever, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's it to chalk it up. Like um, for the first half of the question, I feel like just naturally that whole essence of wanting to take power over you know yourself wanting to regain power over the situations um going on in your life and around you um I feel like that's influenced a lot by just my heritage like who I am naturally I feel like secondly seeing all those things going on like things that are happening in Yemen things that are happening in Palestine things that are happening in Haiti right in the backyard like seeing those things really encouraged me to not you know just live for myself to try and live for like different communities try to do things that are substantial or at least say things that are substantial you know what i'm saying like spread some kind of information or motivation however i can so yeah i think that's all that's what's up that's what's up i appreciate that so we go from we go from one mc in jersey to another mc slash producer in chicago Holding it down. What's up, my bro? G1. Peace, peace, brother. All right, all right. So um, we're from Chile, and we're not just trying to bring Chile into this conversation because we can we fans of our nation. What I found out about the majority of the Haitian uh, refugees that were on the border in these camps is that eight, this is a mind-blowing number, 80% of them were not even coming from Haiti. Yeah. They were coming from Chile. International connection. Why are they coming from Chile? You know, we just spent the last two years in Chile making a documentary film about what's going on over there. And what's crazy is that after the earthquake in 2010, Chile took a lot of Haitian refugees in. Chile has historically been very white country, you know what I'm saying? And so, and it, and, and it has historically also been a country very much polarized politically. You have the people in the poblaciones who just by nature are more dark skinned that are the working class. And you have a very much fascist Nazi sector of society um, who literally in the last five to 10 years, which has been the lifespan of, of the Cuban, I mean, of the Haitian uh, migration into uh, Chile has been the, the wave of anti-immigrant, anti-black 
you know, said energy. And so today in Chile, we have an election as well. December 19th is the election for president. And the fascist populist president who's like a young Donald Trump or young Bolsonaro, you know, you, you have examples of these younger Trumps already popping up with these fascist populist waves. And so I shared that his campaign has ran on two things. Safety, not in the sense of putting fear in the people because of uh, large anti-government protests. And two, fear of immigrants, a.k.a. fear of Black Haitians, uh, Colombians, Dominicans that are the population coming in. And so what they've been doing is doing mass deportations and sending Haitians to Mexico. They don't even deport them back to Haiti. They send them to Mexico. And so um, mass, you know, uh, uh, mass refugee marches, you know what I'm saying? And so how they've, um, you know, mobilized along with the Honduran refugees, these are all connections that are happening in Central America, right? We have uh, a migrant community that's from different parts, from Haiti, from Honduras, from, from Mexico, from uh, El Salvador, um, from Nicaragua, from all parts of Central America that have become weaponized, literally weaponized um, in this global, you know what I'm saying, economy. G, talk to us a bit about, and I'm, I, I knew I was going to send you an answer. I kind of answered my own question, but tell us a bit about, a bit about this global, you know what I'm saying, phenomenon going on with migrants and kind of, you know, share a little bit about, you know, the, the experience with Haitians in Chile. Were So, yeah, um, the the numbers are wild in in uh in right after the earthquake of 2010 uh there was like less than 2000 Haitians uh in Chile and by 2020 that number was almost at 200,000 so a hundredfold increase um and one of the largest populations of Haitians outside of 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 IT or the United States um but like you mentioned i think that the, the main context is that um yeah i know the playground bullies so the US is like the playground bully right and countries like Chile and Colombia are like the little, the little junior, uh, the little guys that help out the bully. <laughs> you know, when we talk about being like junior partners in imperialism, uh, Chile's role, whether it was during the dictatorship uh, from 73 to 1990, or really the, the dictatorship that kind of still continues via the legal infrastructure that exists, um, has traditionally, Chile has traditionally played that role of being like the little junior bully, uh, uh, collaborating with the United States and, and being wow. able to, uh, to put forth policies uh, that really reflect the interests of capital, the interests uh, of the big corporations and a lot of foreign corporations that are coming to extract natural resources. Um, and so Rod, you, and not to take up too much space and time, but I, I think that you mentioned something about the idea of, of weaponizing you know, migrants. Um, and that's something that we've seen time and time again um, uh, throughout history. Uh, but in particular now, when we talk about being an era of, of hybrid warfare, you know, it's, it's, it's no longer the case where, oh, we're going to, we had a nuclear bomb and this other country got a nuclear bomb and it's mutually assured destruction. So what we're in is an era of hybrid warfare where you have, you know, uh, you have digital campaigns, you have uh, information campaigns, disinformation campaigns, and you have a situation where there's a lot of people being driven. Um, we've seen it in Turkey, we've seen it uh, uh, in Belarus, we've seen it in throughout different countries in Europe, um, and we've seen it here in the U.S. as well. Um, and so uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, for me, I think the, the important takeaway is one, to, to realize that, that when we talk about advocating for these people, uh, we need to be clear that those borders are being increasingly opened more and more to trade, to corporations, to capital to flow across, but increasingly being closed off uh, to people. And when we talk about the era of the pandemic um, and a lot of uh, anti-immigrant waves happening in Chile, um, here in the U.S. as well, and we've seen uh, Joe Biden, who you pulled that, that crazy quote from. I guessed it, by the way, that, but, it, but it, is, it was on point because we know his history of, you know, segregation is Joe. Hey, but hold 90s. on. In, in, in New York, we call him Joe Byron. Joe Byron. Oh, my verse, my verse. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, but I, I would say that. I would say that, that, the, that the link be between uh, Chile and, and IT and the refugee uh, crisis has to do with Chile being you know what I'm saying, a junior partner in, in the U.S. imperial project um, where people uh, are not considered as important as profits, you know what I mean? Um, and so we see that, we see that in the increased weaponization uh, of migrants um, in the last few years. 
Word, word. Thank you for sharing that real quick. And so I wanted to also feed off a little bit what you're saying is how this migrant crisis, you could call it, um, or struggle, right, has led the global north, whether it's the United States, whether it's Canada, whether it's countries in Europe that have faced my large groups of migrants coming in, like Italy, like Germany, Turkey, you have the rise of anti-immigrant fascism. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's very much an anti-black and anti-brown fascism um, that's growing in alarming numbers. You know what I'm saying? And so we see this happening um, in countries that are receiving immigrants. We see this happening in Chile. Like on December 19th, there's a slight possibility that a Nazi, gotta call it for what it is, may become the president of Chile. And so this will only lead to more strife for the Haitian immigrants that are over there, for the Colombian immigrants, for the Dominican immigrants, and for poor people overall. So I definitely want, you know, want to bring that around. G, thank you for making that international connection. Um, and so how are we doing on time? I want to make sure that we, uh, that we have, uh, okay, it's 8.51, so we good on time. Um, to continue the conversation, I want to um, throw it back to Kirby. And, and, and if Kirby, you can make some, some connections um, with, with what's been going on in Haiti, but at the same time, like I feel like part of the migrant crisis, there's also a crisis going on here. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and maybe connect some of what's going on. Like some of, you know, cause I know you got your ear to the streets. Um, how do we see some of the crises that are going on and being reflected in the streets of New York? Something, well, before you, I want to say this before I forget. Um, Got it. Feel free to share. Also, feel free. <laughs> no, no, because when you were talking about culture and struggle, like the Haitian Revolution started with a, a voodoo ceremony. People entered liberation fight with the ceremony to the ancestors, asking for strength to take on their oppressors. <laughs> and I just want to uplift that because I think one of the things that people don't understand when they look at Haiti, especially with what's happening currently. What people don't understand is that when you think about Latin America, you think about Venezuela, you think about Bolivia, you think about Cuba, these are nations that have been in solidarity with Haiti from the beginning. If you wanna talk about Simon Bolivar and all of that, that's a whole nother webinar. Um, but that was a comrade that came to Haiti during the early revolutionary phases of Haiti's struggle and asked Toussaint Libertier for resources to fight for liberation in Latin America. So that's why you see certain flags like the Colombian flag and other flags have the red and blue in it as a solidarity symbol to Haiti because without that support, they wouldn't be able to free their folks there. And I think that's a history that people don't understand because of the stereotypes and anti-Blackness that's placed on Haiti. So people don't understand that countries like Venezuela and Cuba gave the Haitian people, I'm being very specific, money for survival. That money was stolen by US-backed puppet leaders in Haiti. They stole that money. So there has been years of organizing struggle in Haiti where people have taken to the streets and are asking, where are these funds that our comrades have given us? Where are they? Right? right? Where, where's the petroleum that our comrades have given us? Knowing full well that a US-backed corrupt government stole resources from their own people, right? So when people see it on TV, they're like, oh my God, they're in the streets. What are they doing? They're being savage. They're literally fighting for resources that comrades gave them that they are not receiving. These are folks that have an 80% unemployment rate. These are folks that are struggling to feed their families who rely heavily on outside solidarity. There are people donating every day from their paychecks to support Haitians, right? Uh, when we think about Western Union or CAM, I don't know if folks know, <laughs> um, who are literally, that's like how money is coming in. That's how the influx is coming in because of regimes backed by the US that are literally making it okay for Haitians to starve and not live. And recently with Moyes and, and you know, 
people have different opinions about him, but this is the same person that wrote a constitution in French so working class people in Haiti couldn't understand it, where he said that he'll be president for life. This is the same person that completely destroyed the judicial system in Haiti, the Congress in Haiti. So anything that he say could be law. But none of that was uplifted. So struggles that are happening to nations that are victims of imperialism, right? Are being sucked dry every day. That factories are opening up in Haiti to produce goods for pennies, right? While workers here struggle the same way and don't get paid for their labor are not being uplifted at all. Instead, there's an anti-Black rhetoric of Haitians destroying their own communities, destroying their own country. You said it before about failed nation states. But if Haiti was a socialist country, right, the US would be like, oh no, Haitians come here. We'll protect you from the socialists. We'll protect you from the communists, come. But because it is a struggle for liberation against capitalism, because people on the ground in Haiti are against capitalism. They're against it. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about how to uplift their labor power, right? They understand that they have labor power, that every day they are producing labor and there's power in that, right? And they also understand that capitalism is allowed to move, but the folks who create the labor power are not allowed to move, right? And so they are organizing every day in the best ways that they can, where they're doing their own mutual aid, where they're learning about revolution. They're, they're studying Chile. They're studying, <laughs> they're studying Marx. They're studying Malcolm. They're studying Chile. They study these folks every day to adapt it right, right, right. in the streets of Haiti because they're continuing to build a movement. Haiti's in a phase where even after, if the revolution was not interjected by U.S. imperialism, they would have had to have been another revolution because Toussaint Louverture wanted to make another France. He was inspired by the white French example, right? By having an elite class, right? So poor working class Haitians, we're gonna fight back regardless. And so right now what we're seeing um, on the ground with young Haitians who are talking to different organizers, they're not you know, looking at the TV to get their examples. They're talking to other organizers about how to organize, what are tactics are you using? These are the tactics that we're using here. And because there are power vacuums in Haiti, right? It's creating these little pockets of, of people trying to fill in those spaces, former cops, right? Um, who are trying to build into that power vacuum and national police in Haiti, because that's the type of security that we have and imperialist puppets in Haiti are allowing that wave, right? Um, the After Moyes was assassinated, uh, a US-backed puppet was put into position, right? They didn't have an election. Um, it was mentioned before, IUC was the first democratically elected president in Haiti. That happened in 1991. From 1804 <laughs> to 1990, there was no democratically elected president. Haitian students were organizing voting drives in their schools and were getting killed because they wanted another system. And so that's the legacy that's still happening today. Um, it's, a, it's a freer space because people are open to sharing their struggle. Um, my, mother, um, my mother came here in 1982, 83, and she was under Duvalier. She was born in 1946. And when I started organizing, she was scared. She was like, wait, what do you, don't organize. Right. Because organizers in Haiti yeah, might yeah. not come home, right. right? There were students being killed in their schools because they wanted to do voting drives and like fight for liberation and talk about struggle. Um, and so that's the legacy that we see not only in Haiti, but here. That's the language that people are using when they're communicating with Haitian organizers on the ground um, in a very, very real and and serious way because they're fighting for their survival every step of the way. That's what's so up. Thank you. People power. Thank you for that. Thank you for that powerful uh, kind of update on what, what, what that history is and what's going on with that. Gazelle, give us a bit. After 40 years of displacement, of violence, of, you know, internal chaos, 
what what do you see um, the direction that that's happening right now in Afghanistan? I, I mean, I know it can possibly still be chaos, but just like kind of like if you give us an assessment of where it's, what direction it's headed in. Um, honestly, it's really concerning because, like, basically now it's winter there and people are starving. They don't have money. Um, people that had been had some savings in the banks, they can't access it because the U.S. has like frozen the bank and the assets, um, like in protest of the Taliban. But the problem is like everyday people can't access money. Um, a lot of people aren't working. Some who are working can't be paid. So aside from people being under threat of the Taliban and their, their policies and, and racism, they're also just under threat of survival just on a basic economic level. Um, and neighboring countries do not want to house those refugees. Um, sometimes they only let them in if they have another visa to another country. Um, the U.S.'s immigration policies towards Afghans has been a mess. It's just, we've been advised at various steps like, oh, there's a CIV visa. Oh, there's a P2 visa. Oh no, do humanitarian parole. And, um, you know, it costs $575 per person, not, not family member, but per person just to file that. And those are being rejected. And I don't know where that money goes. I mean, the U.S. has some like $19 million now from, from the humanitarian parole applications just from Afghans. And there's no transparency in this immigration process. If, if we knew they're not gonna get asylum or humanitarian parole, then we would have just given that money to them so they could survive. But I think it's just tragic, this like smoke and mirrors display of, oh, we care, we wanna help when it's not really clear that that's true, you know. For sure, for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, Jaira, Jaira, Jaira. Um, tell us, tell us a bit about. Um, I read you're working on a new novel, correct? Yes. Um, tell us a bit about that process, and if there's any inspiration uh, in the novel, similar to some of the stuff that you were that you were writing before. Yes, actually, um, I've been working for the past several years on, I put, I put in the comments looking at these, these interim spaces that migrants have to travel through to get to, to somebody. So I'm looking at the Haitian diaspora, and I was working on, still working on a novel about Haitians in the Dominican Republic, and seeing how, a young adult novel, and seeing how that situation is going, you know, um, so it's, 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 it's I've, I've always been concerned about diasporic people, you know, because I'm a first generation. My parents came here in the late 60s, you know, um, had me, sent me to, to Haiti. And then I came back here and I was like that girl who didn't speak English. So I felt I was an immigrant in a way, even though by birth I was, you know, Right. American. So, um, so it's always something that's interests me how people live outside their homes and how they are forced to live, forced to adapt, forced to become something else and what space is waiting for them as they try to, to live their, their day to day life. So this new project was well, not new, it's been working work, work on it for, for several years now. So it's just looking at Haitians in, in, in that particular country. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that uh, you know, for, for us that have been around, you know, in the Bronx and been around the Dominican community a lot, we're very clear that there's a lot of internal racism, you know what I mean, that's over the top. You know, like, I didn't believe it, but they actually have, like, an ID that says, like, you're not Black, you're a dark indigenous. You're dark and indigenous, so they call it crazy. So I, I, I look forward to checking that out that's what's up I, I, that's, that's a good uh, really dope approach uh, mm -hmm. to do and that's uh, definitely want to keep my, my eyes and ears open for that um, 
But I want to do just real quick as we're doing on time. It's 9.05. I want to leave time. Are there folks, because uh, we can't see. Uh, Elena, uh, have been folks been on, on the Facebook at all or the, um, or the no. Zoom? No, we don't have any. We don't have any questions. Um, okay, yeah, but I, okay. I had a question. I, I did have a question that um, for myself that I wanted. Uh, I think um, Gazelle had mentioned started talking about these sort of like bureaucratic sort of obstacles that make um, you know that make the make the refugee experience much harder than it has to be. Um, and I know I had read a lot about for the the the, the situation at the border with the Haitian um, refugees was that this Title Forty Two was being used. Title 42 is this U.S. code about public health. And, it, you know, they're, they're sort of like using that, which has never been used before. But the government's using that as a way to say, oh, well, it's COVID. We have to keep every, it's a, it, we're keeping everyone safe from, you know, disease. I mean, can you guys just talk a little bit more about that? And maybe, and Gazelle, you might want to maybe, um, if maybe Jaira and Kirby want to talk about this Title 42, let people know about what that is. And then maybe, Gazelle, if, you, if there's anything similar or other things that, that you can add on about the, the Afghan experience also about that. These sort of like institutional um, bureaucratic um, um, obstacles. Um, and and, and so Jaira, Kirby, you want to talk about the, the Title 42 before, I, whatever, whatever way people want to go. I mean, I'll, I'll just say something um, very briefly because I don't know too much about um, the, the Title 42, but it's, it's, it's really not surprising. I think, um, you know, when people, when a country says they don't want you, they'll pull out anything out of their arsenal to, to, to protect it, to defend it. So, um, but what I do know, what, what I've, what I do know about what's happening with, with the, the, the border is that, um, whatever title they were trying to do, they did allow um, Haitians to come into the US. I mean, a, there was a 3,000, 4,000 that were deported supposedly to discourage um, further migrants from, from, from coming in. So, but all of these people are in the, the United States um, about, I think the numbers, if I'm not mistaken, was like about 10 to 12,000 and 3,000 are in New York City. So whatever that Title II is that they were trying to use, it didn't hold through because it, eventually they absorb some people, but that doesn't mean that they're safe. You know, so it, it just sent, seemed um, arbitrary in a way. So I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. You know, it's interesting, uh, Elena, and, and I'll quote, because this is a quote that actually from, from one of our previous Voices of Justice, when we had Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., the son of Chairman Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, was on with us. And he said, you know, he said, uh, this pandemic is like capitalism on steroids. You know what I'm saying? And I think that really, if you look at it, like, uh, on top of the fact that it's shown you the, the level of, of, of economic injustice that exists and healthcare injustice that exists, it's also uh, been used as a form of control and, and been used as a form of, of you know of, of uh, pacifying any type of social movements, and so um, I definitely think that you know what what you're sharing about the border is, is not surprising at all, you know. And and uh, I think that it, I think that more than anything, we're clear that when it become when it comes to migrants, uh, we're constantly hearing this idea that they're like you know like the media, the media will be quick to to describe the migrants as, as being sick dirty, unhealthy, like if they're bringing in diseases, like, you know what I mean? These are people that have been, you know, traveling with their families to find a better life and they're being vilified. And so I think that we, we gotta be clear about even those descriptions, even though even what they say is in line with part of their racism, you know? And I, I just wanna also add to that, like, like what you're saying, Jahir, is real and it's true. What they're doing is trying to keep patients out, but also let's not forget our history that it's not the first time that they have tried to use a health crisis to do that. The CDC made a proclamation in the 90s that said that um, Haitians are automatically carriers of HIV AIDS. They wrote it down in their document. Um, even though we know that 
HIV is a disease that destroyed marginalized communities and the government never cared about it in the first place because of who it was infecting, right? Um, but then to say that during a time of increased resistance in Haiti, it only calls for Haitians to be more radical. Any New Yorker, especially a Haitian or a migrant will talk to you about the famous march on the Brooklyn Bridge <laughs> where um, close to what, 500,000 Haitians marched on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, their elders that would be like, the bridge shook, there were so many Haitians on it um, to go against the CDC claim. Um, and it's the same thing that we experienced with COVID in general. What Rod is saying is true. Who was impacted by COVID? Poor working class people. Who were lied to about COVID? Poor working class people. And who died from COVID? Poor working class people. Um, and that includes Haitians who continue to go to work, um, who didn't have the resources that they needed. Um, my family members in Haiti are telling me that because of a lack of resources, nurses are buying their own gloves. They are buying their own masks. They are buying their own syringes to take care of patients in hospitals because no resources are coming in, right? And so it's so ironic um, that they want to try to use a governmental mandate to repress people from finding some type of route to any type of better resources when they continue to not let resources come into Haiti and continue to let Haitians die. Not only in character and reputation, but physically die as well. Yeah, that's crazy. I want to, I, I want to uh, throw the, the convo towards Jer's euphony. Um, if, you, if you had anything you wanted to share, um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about just your experience growing up uh, as a young, to Haitian, your, your family's first generation, second generation. Tell us about, about, about your experience growing up as being Haitian in, in Jersey. Um, I guess I'll bring in the social aspect in America <laughs> with the effect of like all the negative narratives that are put on Haitian Americans, even as kids, like you're very, you're ostracized quite often. Like people kind of have these mindsets about you. And I feel like that's for every culture. And I feel like that's for everyone who's different in America. We've kind of just been taught to, you know, appreciate and accept whatever is normalized and whatever is common. And then seeing someone who's different, or different, we're often, you know, taught to either ridicule it or, you know, shy away from it. I feel like growing up as a Haitian American, there were a lot of things that were already kind of predisposed like pre like ideas that people already had about us that kind of made it hard to grow up and be like a normal kid um yeah but like everything was kind of covered honestly like being Asian here is really um not too different from I wouldn't even I haven't been to many places but I wouldn't assume that it's too different from being anywhere else like we're very rich in culture so anywhere that we go that is not our home I feel like people will look at us a certain way and shy away from us or ridicule us because we're very different we're very ourselves we're very much ourselves like our traditions and things like that it's not something that you can say that is easily or really could be easily accepted by people who are used to seeing a certain thing or are expecting a specific set of things from other human beings. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that I can say that is, you know, positive because there are many positive things about being a young Haitian American. I feel like wherever you are being a Haitian, like you will find people who are um, with you. You'll find other Haitians, like we travel and like just growing up being ostracized from other cultures, like it wasn't so lonely because you could always find someone else who shares your culture who is Haitian because it's like there are certain things that are so rich about us that it's, it's like I said it's hard to miss so growing up you could kind of spot who's family you know what I'm saying so um there's very rich connections like our people you could tell you know who shares with you it's like it emanates 
you know, like our, our blood is very strong and it helps in terms of finding uh, familiarity no matter where you are, so. That's what's yeah. up. I appreciate you sharing that. That's what's up, that's what's up. Um, Elena, do we have any questions that we could maybe open up for some questions? No, but um, again, okay. one other thing I just have, um, because everyone else has been sharing, uh, Jaira and um, Euphony have talked a little bit about their work and how it relates to them. Um, Gazelle, I know you've been working on an art installation, I think, dealing with some of your work and working with um, um, the placement of families that have coming from Afghanistan. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I guess like since July, I was working with several Afghan artists, but one in particular um, who AWA, the Afghan American Artists and Writers Association, had included in a previous exhibit. And um, we had been exchanging so many texts and voice messages um, in an effort to get him out. And actually, I want to say about a month ago, he finally made it to London um, via Pakistan. Um, and so the, the art installation, which will open January 15th in Los Angeles, um, is going to be kind of addressing like the, like the, the burden of trying to evacuate someone as an individual when it really should be the responsibility of like governments and institutions who have failed to do their job and, and really created more chaos for people. And the source material for this installation will be these, these messages. Um, and it's kind of interesting to hear when you hear all the messages you, you you can hear through the artist's voice who I got permission to use his messages, um, how things devolve um, because he's saying like, for example, oh, today the banks are closed or today, you know, I think the Taliban's coming to Kabul or, um, and so it's kind of a personal look into these larger national problems. Thank you. And, and, and one other thing, I mean, since everyone's talking about the work that they're doing in relationship to their sort of activist work, um, G1 and Rothstars, maybe um, you guys have, um, you know, been doing work like this for a long time. Your family comes out of, um, you know, the, the, the issue that your family dealt with in, in terms of having, you know, having to, having to leave Chile. How does it, how does it, how does it come out in your work in terms of um, the, the Chilean issue? You know, no, I, I think, I think that for us, it, it's really been about a lot of our music is, I feel like it's been very autobiographical, but also very much kind of the pulse with the work that we've been doing, you know what I'm saying? So like in 2015, uh, a lot of our music was super inspired by Ferguson because we spent time in Ferguson. A lot of the music that's coming out now that we have coming out uh, has been recorded, energized by the uprising in Chile, you know, by the George Floyd uprisings. Like there's been historical moments of resistance in, in different spaces that we've been um and and definitely something i feel that 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 that's inspired and influenced the type of music that we're doing you know what i'm saying i don't know if you want to elaborate i know you produce man from a produ producer's perspective yeah I, I will add that um that musically you know we, we definitely try to include uh the, the, those legacies of, of resistance through music you know what i mean whether it's sampling a little guitar from our from our parents old school records you know, uh, from from the from the Nueva Canción and the protest folk movements that were in Latin America during the '60s and '70s, and kind of being able to bring that forward still through hip hop, uh, through sampling, through reimagining uh, different compositions. Um, to us, that that speaks to our our, our history uh, of being displaced people. You know what I'm saying? And even with hip hop in and of itself, it's crazy because one of the things that one of the the working uh, hypotheses that we have. Is that you know, in a lot of ways, hip hop is a, is a is a culture of displaced people. It's a revolutionary culture because it's a culture of, of uh, that was created uh, by displaced people. Whether it was the legacy of you know uh, of the slave peoples in the uh, of, in the Americas, uh, whether it was um, immigrants that were uh, uh, you know Jamaican immigrants, Puerto Rican immigrants that were in the Bronx um, during the sixties and seventies. And so for us, we carry that legacy, I think, uh, uh, and and see it as beyond just our individual work and our individual story, but as a larger story uh, of hip hop culture. 
That's what's up. And I feel like that's a perfect segue since we're talking about hip-hop culture. Um, if we get kind of a little energized towards, you know, how we do, end of the, end of the, end of the uh, convo real quick. And I definitely want to come back to, to kind of close it out, but I, I feel like it's a perfect segue to hear uh, another joy from Euphony. If, uh, if we, if, 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 uh, and y'all down to get down. All right, so this <laughs> next one that I'm gonna be doing is not out on all platforms, but it's out on SoundCloud. It's one of the first songs that I ever did. And I feel like it's going to correlate a lot with the things that we were talking about if I add a poem. So I'm going to do half song, half poem, which I do a lot. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, all right, the song called Freedom. They gave me a flow when I switched it. Now I was chosen for this mission. I do not care about their opinions. I gave up on my picket fences. They gave me a flow when I switched it. Now I was chosen for this mission. I do not care about their opinions. I gave up on this one. Uh, let this be my testimony. My hands don't touch the dirty money. I won't sell my soul to get plays on the radio. Always say natural on me and nothing. I take on my failures and flip it. Dream of success and I live it. Promise to stick to my word. So trust and believe and I say this on Mr. Medium. Uncle Sam, I won't sleep for him. I won't dance. I feel myself trying to get some fans. Or trample my folks trying to chase a bag. See, I dedicate my time to activism. So I spit my bars with acid in them. This movement gonna be something holy. If you ain't with it, then Jehovah Witness. I got people with me trying to break the system, putting overtime. But you know, Bob is good and tired of being tired. Young and rest is tired of the bottom. Efforts and it's now it's time to end this life finishing. Spit it equal, yet as dividends. Out here waving where the water is. Waves deep, moving like the wind. I swear when I close my eyes, I can see freedom. When you close your eyes, can you see freedom? My skin is brown. I am the fifth of Nina Simone's four women. I do not speak, I do not speak, I do not speak the language of the damned. You're gonna have to kill my body twice before you kill my mind once and even then my words gonna live forever. I ain't no princess. So who are you to tell me not to dance? When all I hear is it's impossible, you're incapable. When all I hear is music, who are you to tell me not to cry? When I already told myself, when all I have left are tears of joy, that instead of struggling to move mountains, I shouldn't chisel them into masterpieces, because isn't that rebellion? Who are you to tell me that my nature is a sin? That my mouth is like a shotgun and my voice is always spewing bullets? Maybe I shouldn't smile so wide, my shell casings are showing. Why do you always edit my laugh for the sound like homicide? Is it because you wonder how I still rejoice with shackles around my ankles? Aren't I music? See, I have watched as people who look just like me turn their bodies into instruments. Smoke sorrows into song because crying has become uncomfortable. I don't remember the last time I saw brown skin that did not glow, or if I ever have yet. Still, they try to convince us that we are not golden. That we are simply bronze and our work has gone out of style. That our song is like a language lost in translation and maybe it's our fault that they don't understand it. That our delivery is simply too aggressive without any cause at all. That maybe we should slow down the rhythm for listeners like them, have you heard it? The sound of broken promises, bent backs, mama's bedroom turning into ma's, Kevin's gates closing and locking in the distance, battle between black lives and all lives, hashtag versus headlines. I'm asking, have you chosen to hear it? They ask us while we're always dancing to nothing, it makes us look crazy. To this we respond, we're dancing to this raging song that is too often perceived as silence. Tomorrow may be our turn, but today we are our own instrumentals. Freedom. Thank you. So yeah, that was my last one for y'all. Thank uh, you so much for listening and having me. And yeah. Love it. George, we gotta get the little. We gotta get the little horns going, bro. We got we need the funk master flex. <laughs> we gotta drop bombs on this. Drop bombs. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, Euphony, thank you so much. I feel like that's a a, a perfect, you know, way to kind of bring us towards this uh a finale of some sort. You know what I mean? No, thank you. I wanna you. open it up. No, no, for real. I wanna open it up. Um, if anybody has some last comments or uh, ways that, that people can get a hold of you, people are watching, ways that people can stay in tune. We definitely want you to be able to share uh, any last thoughts uh, before we, we close it out. 
So I'll pass it to Kirby. Any last thoughts, Kirby? Yeah. Um, during the uprising last year, Haitians painted several George Floyd murals all over Haiti. And they're watching the case very, very closely um, because they understand that when we end capitalism here, right, and stop this oppression system here, that it'll break the chains there in Haiti and everywhere. Um, Haitians are really, really paying attention to how we're leading struggle, how we're moving in our art, how we're building in our communities, because they view us as comrades. And I think when we look at Haiti, nobody should pity Haiti, no matter how we look at this struggle and how history plays out, because they're fighting. They've been fighting for a long time and they're gonna keep fighting. Um, and they're and they're watching and they're paying attention, you know. And I I think it's like very important for us to, to realize that our work does have impact. I think sometimes it can feel like nothing's moving, but our comrades are watching us and that includes folks in Haiti. And if anybody wants to reach out to me or touch base, organize anything, um, my Instagram is K-E-R-B-I-E-J-88. Um, so Kirby J88 on IG. And my Facebook is my name, Kirby, K-E-R-B-I-E, last name Joseph. So please reach out. That's what's up. Gazelle, you got any last words? Well, you reminded me, Kirby, that actually um, in Kabul, there was also a George Floyd mural painted by art lords. Um, so it really goes to show like how these struggles are all intertwined. Um, and I just wanted to add that AWA is hosting an event. I will put the link in the chat. Um, it's it's uh, gonna be music, poetry, and it's also a fundraiser, but for those who have been involved in supporting uh, marginalized groups, you can also just come for free and be, be nourished. Um, and if you'd like to contact me, you can go to my website, which is just my name, gazellesamizai.com, or my Instagram handle is at gsamizai. Thanks for having me. For sure, for sure. Uh, Jair, any last comments? Yes, um, thank you, thank you to BMHC for, for hosting this wonderful event. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here, for having all of us here. Um, I guess the one thing I'd like to, to, to say is, um, this is the kind of work, like, like Kirby was saying er earlier, that it's always continuous, it, it never ends. It never ends, and I think one of the one of the one of the ways that art art and culture can be um, can help in the struggle is for people to create those kinds of communities like BMHC, you know, to um, to have these very important discussions, and also um, to create archives too, because somebody has to be documenting this type of work that people are doing. Um, so it's very important, not only that we continue the work, but we continue to document it and that we continue to have a place that we can go to study. So we know that it's, we're not one-offs, that this one is connected to that, this one is connected to that, and people can study us, scholars can study us. So it's not just, you know, one-off and one-off. And one of the projects that we're doing at um, the Haitian Studies Institute is created an archive create an archives of, especially looking at um, the Haitian community in New York City. So um, it's a very ambitious project, but it needs to be ambitious in a way because there's just a lot, a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of wonderful work to do too. It's not all pity work. It's all wonderful work. It's all uh, rediscovery. It's all creation. So um, it's all positive, even though it, the base may seem to not be so good, but it's always coming out of for a better at the end of the day. So I thank you and everybody else for that. No, that's what's up. So thank you, everybody. Uh, let's see. What we got is, is uh, you for these around? She bounced. Okay, cool. Oh, wait. So well, before we, before we go, yeah. before no, we yeah, go, yeah. I just want to say, um, anyone watching on Facebook and anyone you can um, anyone you know who didn't catch it tonight, they can go back to the Facebook page and watch it. 
Um, I tried to put everyone's information, all their organization information, websites, um, social media handles in in the in the in the comment section. So if you go to Facebook, you can find all that. If anyone's looking for any of that information, and um, I do want to just make a couple shout outs to people. Um, um, I wanted there was a bunch of people I wanted to thank um, for helping make us happen today. Um, some other artists that work with the um, Afghan community and, and, and displaced families, um, Sahar Muradi and Kehani Rani, who helped me who helped me get connected to um, to uh, to Gazelle today, and um, from the Haitian community, Lo Lois Wilkin and also Lily Marie Serrat, who actually um, also reminded me um, when we had been in touch that this month, December tenth, is also. Um, it just passed the United Nations Human Rights Day, so very relevant to have a conversation on this topic. Then um, on this, so I want to um, to thank them. Um, we want to thank Jorge Vasquez for making everything yes. behind the scenes. A big shout out to Jorge, always making this work. And um, also, again, just everyone who took part today, the members of Rebel Diaz, um, G1, and Rod Stars who make this happen, and all the incredible women who are here today, um, Euphony, Kirby, Jaira, and Gazelle. Thank you all so much, and everyone watching, um, be safe for the new year, and um, be safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone hopefully live next year. That's right, for sure. Thank you, everybody. Peace. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Love.